Thank you all for, for coming back for, for week two, as the term stretches on. Okay, so uh, last week was an introduction to some ideas in the background of understanding happiness. And this week we're talking about saving lives. And one thing which is often discussed in, in ethics is the, uh, uh, is the value of saving lives. And with the, uh, and a, and a popular thought in the, uh, in the effective altruist world is that uh, saving lives could well be the most good you can do. So both uh, uh, Caskill and Singer mention it in their 2015 books as possibly one of the most cost-effective ways to do good. I don't think either of them say it is, but they rate it as one of the, one of the serious contenders. And they, there's just going back to Peter Singer's, um, uh, Peter Singer's pond, shallow pond example, there's sort of a, lo a long history of... of um, that there's a long history of, of thinking saving lives has got to be just a really straightforwardly important and good thing to do. And so my my uh, my aim in in that spirit is to is to try and uh, cause a few problems. So so here's what we're doing today. So first, I'm going to look at four accounts of the individual value of creating and saving lives. So that's the self-regarding life, the value just to the person whose life is saved. And in each of the four cases, which I'll I'll explain as I go. Um, once I've explained them, I'll point out a possible alternative priority in each case. And so I, I don't consider this to be a definitive, this is the thing that you should do if you hold one of these views, but just to point out that there is something else in the region which ought to be, um, which ought to be seriously considered. And the, the idea here is that while people think that saving individual lives is, uh, might be the most good they can do, maybe there is something else even better which is in each of the, each of the regions at hand. So second, I move to the social value of saving lives. So the social value of lives is the impact that life has on everyone else, everyone apart from the person whose life is saved. And uh, one plausible thought is that an important reason to save lives is for the benefit this has on, on everyone else, <coughs> friends and family and so on. So I'll be looking at uh, three parts of this. First is the effect on friends and family. Second, the questions of, uh, of under and overpopulation. And third is the meat eater problem, so the suffering humans cause to animals through their diets. And I'll be examining in each case um, what effect this might have. And my kind of overall conclusion, although there's quite a lot of complexity here, is that this doesn't make saving lives look uh, more promising. So one thought is that uh, when we look at the effects on everyone else, it's really valuable to save lives, or at least that, that, it, that is one strong reason. And actually, as we, uh, as we pick through the different details, it's less obvious than it seems. So I'm focusing here on saving lives with spare resources, so sort of philanthropic cases, as opposed to f uh, personally physically wrenching someone out of a pond, rescue cases. And we might think that uh, different moral rules apply in one case versus the other. So perhaps you're walking past the pond and you see the, you see the drowning child and you have some special duty in virtue of you know, making eye contact with, uh, with that child. That's the kind of view that uh, Larry Temkin is, is drawn to. But, maybe, but, we, we, but when it comes to sort of philanthropic uh, cases, we you know, you know, saliently don't have these kind of special obligations. Um, and although I'll be covering uh, uh, quite a few views, I'll be, I'll be looking at the implications of these views. So um, all of the views will have, um, I'll be looking at the practical implications of these views. All of the views will have some theoretical implications which seem very strange. Um, but I don't have time to, to go into those. So, it's more, so that sort of the flavor will be, if you happen to have this view, you get these results rather than you should or shouldn't have this view. Okay, so the first view is, um, uh, the, first, the first view of the individual value of creating living lives is, is totalism. So totalism, the value of the state affairs is the sum of well-being of all sentient creatures in it, past, present, and future. So for working out how good an outcome is, we just add up the total, uh, the total well-being of, of all of the entities at stake. And um, irrelevantly, totalism holds that, we, that it can be good to create new lives. And the, the other views we're considering will, will not accept that. But we'll, we'll get, to there in a, get to those in a moment. So how should we think about the value of saving lives if we're totalists? Well, um, so it's going to depend upon how much well-being, this is just the individual value of lives, it's going to depend on how much well-being the person would have had had they lived. So, um, and that's going to depend on both the years of life and the kind of the, the quality of life. So, on the top line, um, we're looking at the, the value of saving a life, assuming the person will live at 
happiness level one or well-being level one. It doesn't matter which, of the, I mean, we can use the terms interchangeably for the purpose of this lecture. Um, so imagine that the person will live at uh, welfare level one for every year of their life, and just for, the, just for simplicity, it's going to be this, they're going to have the same quality of life, while the value of saving their life just after they're, after they're created, whenever that is, it's going to be 80 uh, wallies, or uh, well-being adjusted life years. Um, and then just, you know, the value, as the, as the person gets older, the value of saving their life decreases. And then imagine, looking at the second line, there was someone who would live at half, um, sort of at the, be at happiest level 0.5, well, the value of saving their life would be half as good on this view um, for each period, and obviously that, that goes away. So this is not supposed to be, um, this is not supposed to be a you know, at all controversial, this is just, just spelling out the, kind of the basic details of the arithmetic. Okay, so, so the, the thought here is that maybe rather than saving lives, we ought to be saving humanity. So, the uh, Against Malaria Foundation, indicated in the, uh, in the top right, uh, is um, according to Charity Evaluate or Give Well, can save a life for around three and a half thousand dollars. We'll just use that, that, that number for our purposes. So, a thought is that if you're, if you're a totalist, rather than saving individual lives, you might want to be saving humanity as a whole. And this is the um, astronomical waste argument from Bostrom, which I'll give a quote and then explain. So, suppose that about 10 to 10 biological humans could be sustained around an average star. Then the Virgo supercluster could contain 10 to 23 biological humans. This corresponds to a loss of potential equal to about 10 to the 14 potential human lives per second of delayed colonization. So if we're interested in not just the lives which exist now, but all lives there could ever be, it seems plausibly there's just an enormous number of lives that might be at stake if we um, survive and conquer the stars, and that's a, that's a, that, that amounts to a tremendous loss of value if we fail to do so, and that's represented by the, uh, by the mushroom cloud. So, well, how, which one is more cost-effective? Let's just sort of come up with some numbers. I think I've actually taken these from... Uh, from Wilma Caskell. So if humanity lives for 100,000 years with 7 billion of people a century, that's uh, about 70 trillion people. So we're not looking at between now and the heat death of the universe, we're just looking a little bit further in the future. Um, so that's 70 trillion people. And suppose that we think there's a 1% risk of extinction over this century. So the risk for any given year is 0.001%. So if you spent a if you spent a billion dollars a year, you could lower the total risk by one percent. So if we spent a, a billion dollars a year this century, the cumulative probability of extinction goes from one percent to 0.99 percent. So it's a pretty small, it seems like a pretty small decrease. But then there are so many lives at stake. If we think about the the lives this would save, or rather this would, the lives this would allow to be created, who would otherwise not exist, this would save 70 million lives in expectation. For a billion dollars, but I presume uh, none of you have a billion dollars lying around. So let's scale those numbers down. So assuming that the the, the expected value is uh, uh, is just is linear, if you spend ten thousand dollars, you'd save seven hundred lives in expectation. And then we have the Against Valera Foundation, which saves approximately three lives for ten thousand dollars. So if we if you if you started as a as a totalist and you thought that you should be saving individual lives, maybe when we crunch the numbers it looks like it's more promising to be, to be saving humanity. Now, there are uh, going to be some objections to this and I'll, um, I'll, co I'll, I'll cover uh, three before suggesting a different reason totalists shouldn't be so enthusiastic about saving lives. So, we might, so, um, so objection one is that numbers of this sort are something akin to a Pascal's mugging. So the, the story of a, of a Pascal's mugging is imagine you're you're walking along a side street and someone uh, pushes you up against a wall and says, give me your wallet. If you give me your wallet, I will create near infinite value. And you think, this is a strange mugging. And then you think, well, I guess it seems pretty implausible that this guy would be able to create infinite, near infinite value with my wallet. But there's just, you know, even if I think the probabilities are so low that, that, um, uh, that I should just do it. You know, in expectation, it just looks like a really promising thing to be doing because just the numbers are enormous. You might think there's just something really suspicious about this, that we should be suspicious of um, looking at expected value when we've got small probabilities 
and um, small probabilities and really large numbers. So because I've got an, an amount of material, I'll deal with these objections and others somewhat briefly. But sort of a reply here is, well, there are a couple of replies. One is that we might want to, uh, it, one is that we just might think the expected uh, existential risks are really not that tiny. So maybe it's much more than the 1% over this century. Maybe it's something like, like 10%. And then suddenly, um, suddenly it doesn't look so ridiculous. So maybe if we thought there was something suspicious about really high value numbers with um, low percentages, what if we had um, higher percentages, but just with a smaller number of numbers? So maybe we're just going to count humanity over the next 1,000 years. But if the probabilities are higher, then it just looks like a, a, normal, a normal case of uh, thinking it's a, a good thing in, to do in expectation. Just like even if you don't think your bike is going to get stolen on any given day, the chance that it will be and the chance of, and how inconvenient this would be mean that it can be worth spending you know, 20 seconds to lock it up. Another concern is that the, uh, the future might be bad, so if the future is terrible, then maybe we should in fact be trying to, uh, maybe we should in fact be trying to, um, uh, to blow up the universe rather than to save it. So a reply here in this spirit is that if the universe is going to be, if you think the future might be bad, but you're still interested in, in all possible lives, then maybe you should just be trying to make the universe better. So this kind of takes us down a, uh, a different road that we won't pursue, but maybe rather than saving humanity, you should be interested in trying to bring about some kind of social change. And now, rather you to move from saving an individual life to saving humanity to, to improving society more broadly. And again, we're sort of, you know, are we able to sort of dislodge the person who is initially determined about saving individual lives from the position that they held? Another reply might be that we think we can do more good in the near term. So even though if we are, so th th this reply would, would be of, would, would be of the uh, of the flavour that well, okay, so this is potentially the case, but I just disagree with the the kind of cost effectiveness numbers you've produced, and I actually just think that it does do more good in the short term to save individual lives rather than these um, r rather than saving humanity. I just don't you know I just don't believe that we're really able to do that much. So when I run the sort of the subjective probabilities in my head, I just think that doing stuff in the near term is, um, turns out to be better. So uh, I'm not gonna uh, get into this, this is complicated and I'm not even sure I would know how to think about this anyway, but there is there is a challenge in comparing these, um, the, sort of these small probabilities of large events with these much more certain uh, smaller, uh, smaller value actions and it could just be that hard to know what the, uh, what the numbers are even to compare. Okay, so, a couple of objections there for the, uh, for the, the totalist um, implication that we might be trying to save humanity instead. So here's a different kind of problem for, uh, for totalism. So imagine that, um, imagine that uh, there is a family and the family are trying to have two children and they want just two children. So imagine they say that um, if our, do they have one child and they, that their second child is a few years old and they, they've agreed that they want two children so if the second child dies, they will have another child. They will, they will replace the second child with a, with a third one instead. So if we're just looking at the individual value of the children, ignoring the parents and everyone else, um, what, is going to be the, what is going to be the optimum scenario for, these, for this family to have looking just at the individual value of the children? So actually the, the best result on the condition specified is that a child B lives till just before 10 and then dies, and then the parents replace child B with child C. So this might be bad for child B, but then child C gets a shot at existence that child C would otherwise not, not have. So, uh, so, the, so we're looking at the, the value loss, so because this is value loss, so this is positive, so, so the best outcome on the totalist picture is, then again, just looking at the individual value of the lives of the, of the parents' children, Nothing else is that getting to almost ten and then um, shuffling off this mortal coil is the is the best result because you get the an extra ten years of, of life. So um, uh, this might seem like a peculiar way of thinking about things, but this just is a sort of an implication of the view. Um, and in uh, in the kind of uh, so so the setup is perhaps um, also more realistic than it seems. So. The uh, research that has been done into the uh, into the Against Valeria Foundation by 
uh, Gibwell estimate that for every one life saved, about one less life, um, about one less person gets created. So the idea is that family holds a certain number of children, and if you feel like that the children are more likely to live, then you have less of them. So just looking at the individual value for the, for, for the children, then and actually it looks like you're not creating much extra value if you're saving lives in cases where they would otherwise be replaced, because if one doesn't exist, then, I mean, as the name suggests, another one materializes. So this would be another reason, I think a much stronger reason than, than the first, to think that um, on totalism saving lives is, is not so promising. Okay, so we move from, uh, we move from uh, uh, totalism to which was sort of an impersonal view which holds that creating lives can be good and now we're going to talk about three kind of variants of, of person affecting views. So person affecting views are, have the spirit of nobs and dictum, so morality is in favour of making people happy but neutral about making happy people. So here's the thought that, um, uh, that it's not good for individuals to be created. If we're interested in, it, when we're interested in what makes outcomes good, we're really interested in what, what makes things good for people. So there isn't a, so creating anyone isn't, so being created isn't good for someone, so creating lives just isn't good. And even if this is an intuition, even if this is a view many people don't accept, it's at least people can understand the idea of, that, uh, that some people don't miss out if they are not created. And we have some sort of sp more special responsibility for those people who already exist or are going to exist, whatever we do. So uh, this isn't particularly important, but uh, just for, for background information, there are a few ways of cashing this out. So one person affecting view, it would be presentism. So the only people who matter morally are those who presently exist rather than those who might or will exist in the future. Actualism, the only people who matter are those who, uh, who actually exist rather than merely possibly exist. This means future actual people do count. And then there's necessitarianism, uh, which is, even though it's my favourite of the three, is that by far the hardest to say. The only, the only people who matter when deciding between the set of outcomes are those who exist anyway. That is, regardless of what we do, whose existence, whose existence is not contingent upon the outcome of the current decision. So. It won't matter for our purposes which of those is, uh, uh, is the case, but um, so that's kind of a one different view about the value of creating lives. And now we're going to enjoy, kind of conjoin a person affecting view with views about the, with the, the badness of death, the value of saving lives once they exist. Okay, uh, so the first is person affecting deprivationism. So deprivationism as a view about death holds that, holds that death is bad um, uh, someone's death is bad to the extent that it deprives them of the goods they would have had had they existed. So we're imagining there's some person and we're thinking, you know, they they exist now. If they if they don't if they if they die now, then they will sort of they'll be sort of equivalent to being neutral. If we're plotting this, uh, if we're plotting this as a line on a graph. But if they did exist, they would enjoy many goods of life. They would live a happy life, and so it would be. They would, so the the badness of their death is just the is the amount of good they would have missed out on. So this is, is structurally the same as the, as the, as the total views, is the same graph, except that we only start doing this once the person exists. So we're imagining that, that there's a, uh, we're imagining perhaps there's some fetus and there's no value in, in saving its life, but then it gets to a certain stage of becoming a person. And then the, uh, the, the badness of its death is the amount of happiness that entity would have had. So very much the same. So, uh, is it, are we going to be concerned about saving humanity on this view? Well, if you're taking a person affecting uh, deprivation view, then we're still interested in existential threats to, to present people, even if we're not concerned about those who will, not get a, who will not get a shot at existence. So let's say there could be a sudden extinction event, so that's about seven, seven billion people lose about 40 years on average. Uh, so it's equivalent to about uh, 3.5 billion people losing their entire lives, right? And the, in the case of AMF, we would think, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but, but uh, the way the Against Malaria Foundation works is by distributing uh, bed nets in the developing world, which save, um, which mostly, the, most of the value of the effect is that they save children, so children under five. So the kind of the equivalent in terms of the sudden death scenario is equivalent to three and a half billion people losing out on their entire lives. So the, um, the population at stake is, um, 
the, the, in this scenario than the previous one is 20,000 times smaller, which is looking at the uh, you know, half of the, of the current generation in terms of life years. Um, so if, if on our previous calculation, it looked like you could sort of do the equivalent of saving 700 lives, $10,000, this is going to save 0.035 lives. So it's about 100 times worse than uh, the Gensel Error Foundation on this on the kind of this comparative analysis. Okay, so that, that doesn't look like that one's going to go through. Uh, but here's one which, which might, maybe, so uh, possibly rather than saving individual lives, we should be talking about radically extending lives. And the idea is that uh, the distinction here might be a little bit vague. Um, uh, so uh, by saving lives, we're, th we're, thinking about, um, uh, we're thinking about preventing premature deaths, where premature is kind of before the point of of kind of natural life expectancy with natural uh, left slightly vague, um, but then we could think about radically extending lives. So how could we get people to live much longer than they otherwise would do? And kind of a structural difference between this case is that while we're saving lives, is saving lives one at a time. This is about trying to extend the lives of lots of people. Okay, so uh, suppose there was some some research that that allowed seven billion people to live one year longer. So that would be equivalent to saving. 116 million lives, and saving that many lives through the Against Valeria Foundation would cost uh, 400, uh, 400 billion dollars. So I'll come to, there's a couple of contentious assumptions here, but we'll come to those momentarily. So imagine you are, you are sort of a mega Bill Gates, and you have not just, you know, a mere 20 billion of pocket change to throw around for your th philanthropic endeavors, but 400 billion dollars. So let's say you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, I can, I can save all of these individual lives by giving to the Against Valeria Foundation, or I, can be, uh, or I can be extending lives. And I, you know, I happen to have a person affecting deprivation as few, which one of those <coughs> is better? So you might think it's kind of hard to compare these, but let's imagine that you, I can't remember which side, the radical life extension. So imagine you thought the radical life extension, you could, you could actually pull this off, this one extra year for 7 billion people in expectation for $400 billion. If you think you can pull it off for less than that, then that would be the more cost-effective thing to do. So this makes a couple of assumptions. So, um, so in, in both cases, I'm assuming that the expected value of different amounts of money is, is, uh, uh, is linear. So um, let's say we can think about doing the Radical Life Extension or, or going to the Against Valeria Foundation. Presumably, it's going to be a bit hard for a small charity to absorb $400 billion. Um, so, but just don't, you know, imagine for the sake of argument that the expected value of money is just the same. And then with radical life extension, you might think that you know, if you're going to put the first hundred dollars down, that's going to do nothing to fund science. So maybe the returns increase over time. So you know, once there's already quite a lot of money there, then the, then the expected value of, of you know, extra money is, is worthwhile. But assuming that both are linear, um, so the expected returns are the same at different points, and you think, well, I can do radical life extension for $400 billion, so then your, your $3,500 that you would give to one or the other, if you think it would do, it would be more cost-effective at $400 billion, then it would be more cost-effective at, at $3,500 as well. So maybe those interested in, th those who hold person-affecting deprivationist views should be thinking about this instead. And I don't have an argument that they definitely should, that's a, uh, a complicated and empirical question, but this is at least a possibility. So here's, a, here's another alternative, which I think is interesting. So um, one of the things that uh, uh, have recently been um, scorned, notably by uh, the animal rights world, including, the, um, uh, including many bits of the effective altruist movement that think about cost-effectively saving lives, um, cost-effectively helping animals, is that, it's, is that there's a huge amount of money which goes towards um, sort of domestic animals, so things like you know, adorable dogs and, and donkeys and that people give to animal shelters. But if you look at really where the suffering is, the suffering is in, is in factory farms, and that gets a, a tiny amount of the money which humans give to animals to try and benefit those animals. <coughs> so the response is, look, if you're interested in animals, you should be interested in, in the chickens rather than in the, in the pets. But notice we're taking a person-affecting deprivationist view, at least for this part of the argument. So this view is going to hold that there's no value in creating, there's no value in creating new lives. Um, and uh, very plausibly, when we're thinking about the, what our money would do to help 
if given to factory farms, it's not that that helps current chickens, it's that that benefits future chickens. So the future chickens have a higher quality of welfare. Or if you think the future chickens have bad lives and you're trying to stop them existing, then you're stopping future chickens existing. But this view is not capturing the value of doing that. Or at least it's not capturing the value of doing that if you're, if you're holding that there's no value in creating happy lives and there's no value in creating unhappy lives. That's an assumption that we'll, that we'll talk about at the end when we, when we get to the meat eater problem. But assuming you've got this symmetric person affecting view and there's no value in creating lives, there's no value in creating happy lives and no value in creating unhappy lives, then maybe, just maybe, you should in fact be um, giving to the animal shelters. So why is that? So um, animal charity evaluators think that for, uh, think that for a thousand dollars you can save seven lives uh, of uh, th through animal shelters. I don't exactly know what the, where, the, where these numbers have, got, uh, have come from um, compared to four thousand lives if going to an ACE recommended charity. So let's say assume the animal, assume the save animals would live eight years, then three and a half thousand dollars would save. Um, nearly 200 animal years versus, if given to the Against Malaria Foundation, approximately 60 human years. Um, now, many of the dogs I know are, are much happier than, than many of the humans I know. So, uh, if you're taking this view seriously, then, then maybe, just maybe, uh, the animal shelters actually turns out to be the, the more cost-effective way to, um, to, to do good. So, saving animal lives rather than uh, saving human lives. Okay, now we move to our, our third account. So this is the, the time relative interest account. Um, so uh, I'll just explain this and then I'll read out the quotation. So uh, many people have the, have the intuition that it's more important to save 20 year olds than, than two year olds. And the, the thinking it here is perhaps that the two year olds have relatively weak interests in continuing to exist. They haven't sort of developed, they don't have life plans. So they won't be missing out on not having a future in the way that 20-year-olds would. So this is Holtog explaining the view. After all, fetuses and influence usually have rather simple psychologies and thus few of the preferences, memories, and character traits they will acquire later in life. Assuming an appropriately large discount rate then, the time relative interest account implies that the 20-year-old will, will actually have a stronger interest in survival than the infant or fetus has. So on the deprivationist view, the badness of death is just the total amount of well-being the individual would have had. On the time relative interest account, it's the total amount of well-being the person would have had, but then this well-being is discounted by how connected the person is to their future self. An idea is that the very young child is just not very connected to their future self at all. So here's what the, uh, here's what the, the value of saving lives looks like on the, um, on the time relative interest account. So it's going to be something like this. So, um, so the value of saving lives is the difference between kind of here and then where the person would have, uh, how, how, where the person would have got to had you not saved them. So let's say you've got a 20 year old um, and we, you know, we might think that, okay, so the value, once someone has got to 20, the value of saving their lives is sort of like 60 years, okay? Um, and then we've got the, the five year old and they have much weaker interests. So the value, so if, if, if we think that the value of saving a 20 year old is, is 60 units, then the value of saving the five-year-old might be, you know, 40 units or something, or even smaller. And the point is that this, this gets a, that the, the, the younger the person is, the less valuable it is in saving lives, the less valuable it is saving their life. And if we're going all the way back, you, that you've got some non-existent entity who has no interests at all in the future, and on this view, it seems like there, there can be no reason to, uh, there can be no reason to create uh, that person, or, and there would be no value in, have they, you know, existed for a, a moment as a series of cells in, in then saving their life. So that's kind of a, a different view one might take. Now where does this take us? So when we're thinking about saving lives philanthropically, we're often thinking about saving very young lives, uh, that at least at any rate is what the Against Malaria Foundation does. And this view holds that saving young lives is much less important than saving old lives. So when we're doing the calculations, we'll, we would need to adjust that to, to account for this fact. So um, two people who look at all the same facts, one of whom holds a person-affecting deprivationist view, the other of whom holds a person-affecting time-relative interest account, will disagree on the value of, of saving the same life. And the younger it is, the less valuable the uh, time-relative interest account advocate, the TRIA advocate, will think it is. So how... 
if we're on this view, how good are life extension and reducing existential risks, the, the other things that, uh, that kind of possibly cause problems for the, um, uh, for the person affecting deprivationist view? Um, well, life extension is presumably going to apply to people later in life. Um, so it seems like it would be more likely to benefit those, uh, whereas the saving the lives in the, in the Against Malaria Foundation case are of the saving the young lives. So in as much as we think it's better to be saving older people rather than younger people, that's going to have relatively more weight um, relative to the total amount of life years that would be saved. And then we might think that something with a similar about reducing existential risks. So, the, so while with Saving the, saving the individual lives of young people we're, by saving humanity, we're, there's some value in saving, we're saving older people and not just, you know, sort of across, um, old, older people than, than we would do in the, uh, in the charity case. Um, so maybe those look more promising. Uh, I don't propose to, uh, to, to run the numbers here. Um, unclear if proponents of this view would think there was any particular value in keeping animals alive. So, um, Proponents of this view seem to th like would seem to think that uh, we don't we don't harm an animal by uh, by killing it on the grounds that animals don't have exist don't have um, don't have interest in continuing to exist. They have interests in given that they exist, not experiencing pain, but they don't have interest in continuing to exist. So I don't know if the the time relative interest account advocates would would um, would bite so to speak on my um, animal shelter example. Um, so, is there a way of improving lives, so increasing the well-being of people whilst they're alive, increasing quality of lives, uh, that would do more good, such as alleviating poverty or treating mental health, than saving lives? Well, it's, uh, that's too much of a diversion to calculate here, although that's what we will be discussing uh, next week. So we'd need to settle um, how, we, how we kind of draw the graph on the time relative interest to count the value of saving lives at different points. We need to work out how cost effective it was on that discount to to save lives, and then we need to work out how cost effective it is to improve lives. So there's a there's kind of a few a few bits and pieces that we would need to get into there. Okay, and then the, the third view is um, Epicureanism. This is named after ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, uh, who holds that death is not bad. So a uh, famous Epicurean phrase: "When death is here, we are not." When we are here, death is not. And the idea behind this is that there is, um, is that is that death is that my death is in is in no way bad for me. There's no, and, and the way I'm kind of extending this to to fill out the slot is that there could be this that there, there, there could be this view where there's just no value in saving lives. So a bit like person affecting views will hold there's no value in creating lives. Not that the value is zero. There just isn't any value. In the Epicurean view, there's just no value in saving lives. And if this is, if this view is, if, if this is the view that you, uh, that you held, that there would be no individual, there would be no value to saving lives it, regarding the individual value. So if this is the view you held, you know, it would be sort of mysterious as to why you thought saving lives was the most good you could do in the first place. But there are a couple of problems with this view and I'm, I'm uh, so uh, I am sympathetic to this view, but it's not, quite clear how the view works, uh, which is a problem. Um, so here's a, here's a couple of um, uh, a couple of problem cases. So imagine that, that um, dangerous surgery, a person, we have an ill person, Dan, uh, and there are three possible outcomes. So Dan has the surgery and it goes wrong, so he dies at 30. Uh, he doesn't have the surgery, so he lives an okay, moderately good life to 80. Or Dan has the surgery and the surgery goes well, so Dan lives a happy life to 80. So these are our three possible outcomes. Uh, what do you want to say about this? Well, it seems like the, f the flavor of the Epicurean view is to say that death is, um, is neither better than nor worse than life. So we're going to say that those th two things have the, have, are, are of equal value. But presumably you want to say that if the person is going to exist, it's better that they have a happy life than an okay life. So then happy is better than okay. But then the problem with this is that we now get in transitivity. So, if um, if happy is better than okay, uh, if happy is better than okay, uh, then it seems like uh, okay must be better than death. But these two are equal, and these two are equal. So, yeah. If, I mean, if these, so if these two are equal, then it, then if those two must have then happy and okay must have the same value, then happy can't be better than okay. So. Um, uh, maybe
maybe it seems like the, the way this view ought to work is a bit like this. So the omegas represent incompa incomparability. So um, death is incomparable to living happily and living the okay life is incomparable to living happily, but living happily is better than okay in, in the situation in which the person uh, does exist. Um, so just to ex explain this slightly, um, let's say I ask you how much money have you got in your bank account um, and you tell me you have no money, you, you tell me you don't have a bank account, uh, you might think I just, that, that you have, so another alternative would be that I ask you how much money you have in your bank account and you do have a bank account but you have no money in it. So these two are different. In one case, you, I mean, in, in some case, so in one case we would say you have zero money, so it has a value and the value is zero. In another case it has no value because you don't have a bank account and that's sort of how how the incomparability is supposed to work. But this leads to sort of some, some weird scenarios. So problem case two, um, Russian roulette. So let's say uh, Russian roulette, we take a, take a revolver with um, one bullet in it uh, and I offer you this gun and I, I, and I know you happen to be an Epicurean and, uh, and I say, look, if you, if you win, uh, Maybe I've got this the wrong way around. Uh, okay, maybe it needs to be, maybe it's with five bullets in it and there's one empty chamber. Okay, that's the okay, gap. Yeah, fine, we'll go with that. Um, so if you, if you survive, then uh, you know, I will give you riches and fame and you think, oh, okay, my life will go better for me if I survive than if I don't play. Okay, but you've got a one in six chance of surviving because there's only one empty chamber. And if you don't play, your life continued as normal, let's say that, you know, you get 100 units of value, whatever these things are. So if we're looking at the expectation of value, um, it seems like if we think that, if we think that uh, playing and losing is equal to having zero value, then the expected value of playing uh, is bad. So on a deprivationist account, you know, just obvious it's a terrible uh, idea to play. But if we think that the, if uh, we, but we can get some weirdness if we think that the value of losing is um, incomparable, the value of losing is incomparable with the value of, of the other states because in those other states you exist. So it's not, it's not uh, quite clear to me how the um, expected value is supposed to work here because, because the expected value of, uh, of the case where you play is, you know, it's once one in six you get the better outcome, so that's, you know, that's, that's good. Um, but then five out of six, you don't exist, so that's incomparable in value. So um, I don't quite know what to do with this. But um, after this, uh, Ralph Bader will be giving a class on population ethics, and I'm led to believe he will be solving these problems, so um, maybe I'll find out what the answer is in an hour's time. Okay, so that's the, that's the four bits on the social value of lives. So if we're totalists, maybe we should be saving humanity, but there's also these concerns about replacement on the person affecting deprivationism, maybe life extension is better or saving animals in shelters. On the time relative interest account, uh, we're discounting the value of young lives. So maybe there's something else as a better way to do good by improving lives. Um, and then the Epicureans, however this view is supposed to work, it seems like the flavor of it would be that there's just not particular, there's no value in, uh, in saving lives at all. So we should be doing something else. Okay, so the social value of lives, um, well, one very common response when talking about the, the overall value of lives is that a big reason to do it is because of the impacts on other people. So the overall value of lives is the, just the individual value plus the social value. That's the, that's the whole thing we're looking at. The value to the person whose life is saved and the value to, uh, it has on everyone else. So we could, and there's any number of ways of splitting these up, but I'm gonna split this up into three. So the first is, um, the impact on friends and family, the second is on wider society, uh, present and possibly future, and the third is other sentient life, so on non-human animals. And it's when discussing other sentient life we're going to talk about the, uh, uh, the meat eater problem. Um, although, I mean, we, yeah, so, okay. Um, so how big is the friends and family factor? Um, so it seems like it's, it's, uh, I would think it's probably relatively small compared to the individual value, assuming that the person effect, on a kind of a person affecting deprivationist account or on a total account without any replacement cases. So imagine that uh, uh, I live another 60 years 
Um, so that's 60 well-being adjusted life years uh, for saving me. But if I die now, um, my friends and family um, will be permanently sad about this, but how sad will they be? So we might think, you know, a sort of at a, uh, we might think that, that it will remove half of the, it will take away half of, of someone's net happiness. It take, you know, my friends and family from one, one being well, well be adjusted life years, so at level of one happiness to, to level 0.5, and maybe that would happen for, for 10 people for, uh, for a year, say. So that's really, that seems quite dramatic that you're taking half of all someone's net happiness away. And so this gets us to, uh, say, five well being adjusted life years. Um, so if the value of saving my life is 60, the individual value, and the friends and family value is five, then we can see how it's kind of relatively smaller. Um, but that's just at a, at a first pass. At a second pass, um, this, might be, this might be smaller still, because the value of, so uh, here's a, uh, a morbid thought. It's that um, uh, uh, if and when I die, presumably there will be some people who, who will be sad. So if I die now, it will, um, it will be a great tragedy, not least for me, cutting short my otherwise uh, stellar philosophical career. But if, um, uh, but if I die at a later point in life, people will also be sad. I will presumably have some friends and or family then, and they will be sad about it. So the badness, of my, uh, the badness of my death now, in terms of the friends and family value, is not just the sadness that would occur in the next couple of years, it's the, it's the counterfactual sadness between my death now and my death later. So presuming that, that people are going to be sad later and sad now, it's just the, the difference between those two things. So maybe that's not so big. How big is it? Um, I'm not going to venture a precise answer there. Okay, so that, that maybe doesn't look as, as kind of, the friends and family value doesn't maybe look as chunky as we might have expected. Um, and now we move, on, move into uh, even more controversial waters. So uh, many people are concerned that the Earth is um, overpopulated. So the current population size is bad for the environment. Um, there are concerns about the carrying capacity, the environmental resources that the Earth can have. Um, there being more people, sort of, uh, there people emit p pollution and use up resources and, and space and so on, which would, would, which would be used for, uh, which would be used for others. So um, many people seem to seem to have the view if you if you corner them a, corner them in a in a pub and ask them about this. I think the Earth is overpopulated. That is, that the overall value of creating lives is negative. So, on a the totalist view compared to the person affecting views, they're going to think about this differently. So, saliently, on the totalist view, that you're creating the individual value, the in, creating a life uh, can be good because it uh, creates a value for the person that exists, uh, or just creates an impersonal value. Um, but then we also count social value, the impact on everyone else, and then on person affecting views, there is no value in, it's not good in this relate, there's no individual value of creating new lives, but there is nevertheless the social value. So uh, people can think about this differently. So let's say, um, let's say the, the uh, Wally value of saving, the individual Wally value of saving my life is 60, um, and maybe we think the social value I impose on others so I'm just at the start of my life, the social value I impose on others would be equal to, to minus 20 wallies. Okay, I'm just making these numbers up. So if that would be the case, um, <coughs> then uh, if that would be the case, then on, uh, on, the, on the, so creating me with that life, oh, hold on. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, so um, on, the, on the total view, if I would have, let's say, okay, I'll say it slightly differently. So I would be created and I would have 80 happy years, but I would impose costs on other people equal to, uh, to 60, then the total value of saving my life at, at birth would be, would be 60 units. So on, on that account, um, the earth, or for totalists, the earth would be underpopulated, but let's say the social value at the, that you would think I impose might be like, you know, I would impose minus 90 well-being adjusted life years, I would experience 80 myself, so then the earth would be overpopulated. Um, and then on person affecting views, the value of creating new lives is bad, just if we think people cause any uh, negative um, impacts on others. So if we are overpopulated, and I'm, I'm not claiming that we are, but many people seem to believe this, 
and we hadn't included the social value, which by stipulation, because we're talking about overpopulation is negative, then when estimating the overall value of lives, the overall value will now be lower than if we had not considered this. And this might continue to take a, you know, a reasonably big chunk out of the value of saving lives. Um, but that is one side of the analysis. The other side is the Earth may indeed be underpopulated. We might think the larger population is, is better for, uh, for various reasons. So Esther Bozerot um, argued that, uh, uh, that when it comes to uh, demographics, uh, mother is the necessity of invention. So the reason that we see innovation, in, say the uh, industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, is that, is that because there is a larger population, that, that forces people to develop better tools um, and so, so a bigger society creates problems, which which society is then forced to solve. So the kind of one concern with um, the world being overpopulated, and this was kind of popular in the 80s and, and no longer so. Um, people like Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb believed that they just the Earth wouldn't be able to feed everyone. There just wouldn't be enough resources. Um, that population would increase exponentially, but increases to agricultural yields would increase only linearly. So eventually there was just going to be famine and disaster and we should do something about it now. But the, the other way of approaching this is that when we have greater population pressures, people innovate and they, they improve their, uh, they improve. And that's what seems to, that's what seems to have, have happened uh, in the last 30 years and why there are not famines as predicted. I would also think that if there's a, a larger population, we can uh, we can more easily kind of support things we think are valuable and produce value for society, such as science, academia, and art. So imagine that we are a kind of a hunter-gatherer tribe, and um, you know there's 150 of us. So probably such a tribe could only, if it wanted to, and it pulled its resources, support one full-time metaphysician, and that would obviously be a tremendous tragedy. But because we have a huge society, we can have whole departments filled with metaphysicians and. Meta metaphysicians and, and so on. This is obviously tremendously valuable for the rest of us. And so we can see how this extends to uh, we can see how this extends to other things. So we've got these kind of different different ways of pushing it. So let so let so more people are bad with respect to certain kind of environmental resource costs, but maybe more people are good with respect to these kind of um, uh, efficiencies and specialisations and promoting innovation. So maybe the Earth is underpopulated. So for the individual value of my creating new life is, so the individual of my life on the totalist picture is plus, you know, I would get 80 happy years, 80 wallies, and maybe I only impose, as I mentioned earlier, so minus 13 other people, then the earth is underpopulated, so we need to be creating more lives. Um, and maybe we think that, that uh, on the person affecting views, there's, uh, that my, I have positive externalities on others, then, um, uh, then, the social value of the lives is positive and more people are good. So uh, which of these is true? Um, uh, despite strong opinions on the matter, I, uh, it's, not, it's not clear which, which is the case. Um, but one thing which is, is worth noting is that if we, when we analyze this question, we, we should, depending upon the kind of view of, of the individual value of lives we have, we will have different time scales. So on a, on a totalist type view, where we're interested not just in present people, but in uh, uh, all possible people, then when we think about overpopulation, we should be thinking about the impact of people now into the far future, and not just now. On a person affecting view, we're just interested in, you know, what are new people going to do to the, the well-being of current people? Um, and it's just kind of not really, sort of, it's not really obvious uh, um, on either the short or long time sc scale, which is the case. Um, so the picture I sort of sketched about the more people impose certain resource penalties, but maybe there's some efficiencies elsewhere. That's kind of the shorter term picture. You know, if we're interested in the long term, um, the question was be, you know, how is how is a larger or smaller population now going to impact um, impact humanity's long run? Um, and this is a, a suggestion I got from uh, Will McCaskill. Maybe with maybe we think the larger population is uh, is better because it allows us to engage in some kind of grand endeavor that we can have lots of resources to try and um, uh, create space probes and, and colonize the colonize the galaxy so maybe a large population is good in that extent because we have a larger economy but maybe a large population is 
uh, maybe a smaller population is better because we can stay on the earth for a long period of time and conserve our resources and really, you know, plan things. Whereas if we had the large population, we might be churning through the earth's resources um, and creating kind of an unsustainable future. So on the long time scale, it's not um, at least immediately obvious whether more people or fewer people is good. So is the earth under overpopulated? Um, well, it's really, it's, uh, it's very hard to say, but it seems like we ought to try and work out the answer to this question because it has such an impact on uh, the value of saving lives. And so for people who, who think the earth is, um, who, who sincerely think the earth is overpopulated, um, such as perhaps uh, Peter Singer, then uh, you know, this is the, the social value of lives, is the, the social penalty of lives is going to be really quite substantial. And so that's going to change our analysis of the value of, uh, the overall value of lives. Um, yeah, okay, so aside, um, maybe this talk about global optimum population is, is uh, hard to do, but maybe we can talk more sensibly about regional optimum population. So maybe um, Japan is underpopulated and Italy is underpopulated, but because of the kind of demographic society with sort of too many old people, but maybe it works differently in, in other parts of the world. Okay, so that's optimum population. And now in the last seven or so minutes, I'm gonna say a little bit about the meat eater problem. Um, I'm not gonna be able to go into this in, in great detail, but I will pick this up as other things in, in questions. So many people accept it's wrong to be a meat eater. By this, I mean someone who, who uh, regularly consumes products produced in factory farms, not literally someone who eats meat, just this kind of general term for a factory farm consumer, because of the suffering this causes. So many people think that we ought to be vegetarians for a number of reasons, so for the environment, um, uh, for animal rights, but this is just focusing on the suffering part. So um, it seems like if we're interested in uh, not just in humans, but in sentient life, then we might think we need that concerns for meat eating should cause us to reduce the value of saving human lives by some amount. So, how much is this? You know, is, is this a rounding error? Is this extremely substantial? So, it's, we'll just make a little bit of, uh, we'll say a little bit about this. So, Matheny and Chan estimate the average American. I don't know why I've capitalised average. The average American would need to eat uh, 82 chickens a year if they got all of their 20 kilos of protein uh, from chicken meat. So about 80% of animal life years in the US are lived by chickens. There are, there are just lots of chickens and not so many pigs and, and cows. So this isn't a very distortionary assumption. Um, so as chickens live about seven weeks before being killed, meat eaters therefore create about 10 chicken years for each year they live. <coughs> okay, so what? So we're, we're assuming that uh, here that uh, humans are happy on average and chickens are unhappy on average. If chickens were happy on average, then we might think we should be trying to create more chickens. Um, so this kind of argument gets going if we think that chickens have an average unhappy lives. Um, so suppose chickens live at ha happiness level minus one um, and humans are at happiness level X. So the question is, what is X? So if X is one, um, humans are as happy or chicken, as chickens are unhappy, and then humans are creating 10 chicken years for every one human year, it would seem like uh, meat eaters are, uh, are causing 10 times more unhappiness than they are uh, experiencing happiness themselves. So that's really quite you know, a, large, um, a large net amount of suffering caused per human life year. So plausibly, I think, um, X is one, and here's a, here's a sketch of, a, uh, of an argument. So when I think about, um, when I think about my, my own life, there are, of course, many, uh, many happy moments giving this lecture, uh, highest amongst them. But you know, the, kind of the, the ordinary hours of my life are, you know, they're sort of mildly nice. I, am, I'm not, you know, I do not suffer from, from chronic ecstasy. Whereas if I think of the life of the animals in factory farms, uh, they are plausibly um, uh, stressful or painful. So about for the last 20% of, uh, of a chicken's life, they, will, they, they grow so large because of the way they've been bred that, that they will be in, um, uh, uh, apparently in, in chronic pain from, the, from how big they are on their, on their tiny legs. Um, so if I think that my life is only kind of mildly good, 
on this kind of absolute scale of of, uh, of happiness we're, we're uh, I'm, re I'm kind of uh, relying on, then it seems like if chickens' lives are sort of mildly stressful, then that just might be, you know, and that's and there's that's kind of the average state. Then it might be that these are roughly similar. So. Uh, if that's the case, if X is 1, then humans cause 10 times more unhappiness, or at least meat-eating humans do, to animals than they experience happiness themselves. Um, yeah, so if, if, we, if we really believe this, then uh, this looks like potentially quite a major factor in thinking about the value of saving lives. Um, so there are, some, there are some objections. I'm, I'm only going to go through these... Uh, I'm only going to go through these uh, quickly, but these are these kind of different categories of, of objections, which kind of uh, reduce the, the initial apparent strength of the argument. So we might think that guessing at the comparative happiness of humans and animals is just simply nonsensical. You know, just you know, what are we even doing when we say humans are at happiness level? You know, chickens are at minus one and humans are at X. Like this, just whole endeavour is just is just insane. Um, but it seems like people who are prepared to accept that humans cause suffering to animals have already made some sort of, they've already had some thoughts like this, they're prepared to quantify the amount of happiness or unhappiness animals experience and that's one reason to think, well, that's you know, the main reason to think that um, uh, it's wrong to eat meat if you think there's the suffering that causes. Um, we might think this is just hard to estimate. Um, you know, how, do we, how do we know what X is compared to the experience the chickens feel. Well, but this is just kind of a, this isn't a deep philosophical problem, this is just a, a question of probabilities and we can, we can, you know, we could run a poll and we could look at, uh, you know, our, our probability distribution, how probable it is that we think X is at different numbers and come to a, a weighted average. There's nothing too mysterious there. Um, you might think that I've, I've just really uh, overestimated the badness of animal suffering or underestimated the, the, uh, how, how happy humans are. Um, and this could well be the case. Um, so I imagine people will have different in intuitions here. But if this is true, this doesn't make the problem go away. It just reduces the, the strength of the conclusion. Um, I've just been talking about happiness here, and happiness just in the sense of um, a positive balance of enjoyment over suffering. But many people think there is more to life than there, there is more to life than happiness. So remember from the say from the objective list uh, discussed last week, we might think there are other things which matter uh, besides happiness, if happiness is even on the objective list, such as kind of friendship, autonomy, knowledge. Um, and you might think humans have these things, but uh, animals do not. So this is increasing the value of, of human lives. And so this, well, th this could well be true, um, and, but this kind of just reduces the force of the argument rather than removes it altogether. Um, we could think we should imply a pure species discount. So if we're going to, uh, we could think about adding one unit of happiness to a human and one unit of unhappiness to a chicken. We might think in virtue of the fact that chicken is a chicken and therefore doesn't say have the relevant ra rational capacities that humans do, we should give, uh, that, should, that, that, that is less good. Um, or uh, maybe it's as good, but... Um, when we think about what we ought to do, we, we, uh, the, our obligations are weaker to, our obligations are, are weaker to, to non-animal, to, to non-human animals than to, uh, than to humans. So maybe we apply some sort of discount. And again, this, this, um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure this is, this is plausible, but even if it is, this just reduces the, the strength, the strength of the argument somewhat. Um, one suggestion in this case would be if we're worried about this, maybe we should um, be saving human lives and then getting people to become vegetarians or giving or providing life-saving medication conditional only on uh, switching diets. And so uh, this is somewhat implausible. Um, a more serious concern, or not concern, a more serious objection uh, is that we might think that clean meat, so lab-grown meat, um, will is just around the corner. So even if meat eaters are causing suffering now, we will all become post meat eaters, people who eat lab grown meat you know, any day now. And if that's the case, then um, you know, imagine that tomorrow all meat eaters switch to lab grown meat. Well, they're not gonna be causing any more animal suffering. So the force of the argument disappears. So 
I don't have time to go into the calculations, but you know, depending on how quickly you think the transition to clean meat will occur, if it will occur, that will cause you to reduce the value of this as well. Um, so there's a, I've actually got two, two further things to, to say here. I've missed number nine. So um, if we're taking the, so this, the, I don't think the concern for the, the, I don't think the meat eater problem applies if we think that the humans will be replaced. So imagine we, or at least it's substantially weakened. So let's say we thought, oh, okay, this meat eater problem means we really ought not to be saving human lives. We should be reducing the value of doing so. And imagine the, the two family case. So we think, uh, we, so this family have one child and they, um, so they have two children. We think, well, you know, we could save the second child, but if we do, uh, it will just go on and eat lots of meat and cause lots of animal suffering. And we're very concerned about that. But then if we think that, you know, if child two um, dies, then parents will have a third child. If we think they have this replacement effect, then uh, it's not going to make very much difference because you still get, you know, effectively lots of years of, of human life lived. Um, and uh, the final thing is that um, uh, is that this argument will you know, will we'll not go through on on all views. So if you were to take a symmetric person affecting view where there's no value in creating happy lives and there's no value in creating unhappy lives, well, there's just no value in creating lives full stop. So then there's no place in your moral framework for being concerned about about the value of uh, about the value of uh, of unhappy animals. Um, so it'll be those who think that there is some value in, there is something bad about creating unhappy lives. So um, many people who are sympathetic to person affecting views, that there's, you know, there's no, that, uh, will think that there's no value in creating happy lives, but it is bad to create unhappy lives. And so if that's the kind of view you, you, hold, uh, you, you hold, then the meat eater problem would nevertheless be a, be a live problem anyway. Okay, so that's, uh, 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 that's, uh, that's it, let me sum up. So we looked at the individual value of lies. Uh, I suggest there are four different, uh, four, four different accounts. These are not all of the possible accounts. These are just kind of the more common ones to get the arguments uh, going. So on totalism, the concern is that we might be better to save humanity rather than save individual lives. On person affecting deprivationist views, maybe we should be extend radically extending lives rather than saving lives or perhaps um, saving animal lives through shelters. On the person affecting time relative interest account, which holds that it's better to save 20 year olds than two year olds, um, uh, because we're reducing the value of saving young lives. If we are saving young lives, then we need to reduce the value uh, substantially. That's just the view. And so this might put, uh, change our calculations. On a person affecting Epicurean view, well, there's just no value saving lives in the first place. So that it would be a mistake to, it would be sort of confusing if someone thought that there was. We move to the social value of lives, the friends and family effect. Um, sorry, yeah, so for all of those, the point is that we might start with thinking saving lives, individual lives is the best thing to do, and then we're, you know, we're at least pushed in another direction or, or prompted to consider something else. Uh, the social value of lives, I looked at the friends and family effect, and counterfactually, somewhat grimly, that, that might not be as big as we thought it was just looking at the, the more immediate effects just after the person, uh, just after someone has a premature death. Um, the questions about under and overpopulation are, uh, are although extremely emotionally um, uh, pronounced upon, it's not really clear what the answer is. But if there were to be an answer, um, it would potentially make quite a big difference, so we should find out what that answer is. And then finally, I talked about the, the meat eater problem, so the effect humans have um, on animals through their diet. And, um, and if you think that we ought not to be uh, meat eaters, uh, then potentially this is going to cause quite a substantial reduction, although there are, you know, I talked about some kind of objections and so on. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. please feel, feel free to leave, but if you'll have questions, I will happily answer questions. Uh, one of the things I, I could talk about if people are interested is the kind of the counterintuitive implications of the different views of the individual value of lives, which wasn't relevant, but might be interesting.
think it harms an individual if the individual lives, you know, a shorter happy life rather than a longer happy life, even though death is not intrinsically bad. Uh, we can compare lives of different men, lives that contain different amounts of goodness and so on for the individual. So I, I mean, I would find it rather plausible to say that death doesn't harm anyone at all. The person would have that. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it implausible as well. I just find it um, uh, less implausible than the other views on the table. Yeah, but that's only because you didn't consider a wise person making. Well, I, you, you will have to, you will have to correct me of my, of my errors after the lecture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how to think about this on a wise person effective view. Uh, and yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in discussing that. Um, talk about the, the badness of uh, the different views of the badness of death. So on the uh, deprivationist view, the idea is that once someone starts to exist, um, then it's, you know, the, the value of the saving them is just the amount of happiness they would have had. But we don't, crucially, we don't count the value of, um, there's a very big difference between someone exists and when someone doesn't. So uh, imagine we, we decide, uh, uh, however, the, the, however we do it, that um, a person starts to exist six months after conception. Okay, so we have uh, we have uh, two uh, two mothers, and we can only we can only help we can only uh, help, and both of their their uh, babies are, are ill. Uh, babies are in, in utero, and we can only save one. Okay, so one baby is um, is uh, five months in. 25 days old and the other one is uh, is six months and five days old I mean you know just whatever it is one, one side up you know, it's minus six months six months minus one day six months plus one day so on the on the deprivationist view this is you know, this is an enormous difference this makes a huge a huge difference which one we uh, we do cause to exist and maybe people think that it's just kind of implausible that um, on the basis of a seemingly arbitrary distinction so just being a little bit older it could make all of this huge difference between uh, over how uh, how valuable it is to save that life um, compared to the other one. Uh, so uh, Toby Ord has a, uh, uh, a rather nice paper where he he talks about the scourge, and the scourge is this disease which causes which kills two hundred million people a year. And uh, he says like, look, there is this, it's you know it's causing two hundred million deaths a year, and really this ought to be a huge priority. It's causing more deaths than anything else, and so I forget the biological details, but he points out, but so he says that if you're going to take the take seriously the view that life begins at conception, this kind of uh, uh, Roman Catholic perhaps view, then um, uh, then there are lots of there are lots of uh, fetuses which spontaneously terminate. So they terminate within about the first five or so days. So if you do really take the the deprivationist view seriously, and you think that life begins at conception then you have this radical view whereby it seems like one of humanity's greatest priorities is stopping these totally natural uh, terminations. So, as in other case in philosophy, you can either reject the view or you can bite the bullet. Um, and uh, Toby's, uh, uh, Toby's pressure in this, uh, in this argument to say that, well, look, even people who, take, who say they take this view seriously don't really seem to believe this. They don't, if they did really believe life began at conception, um, then they should be doing something about this, but they're not, so therefore they can't really be believing it. So that's, um, uh, but I mean, but that's particularly, yeah, so this problem of sort of the sharpness of, of life versus not life is going to be problematic um, on the deprivationist view. And then I think I've got, oh, it's going to take me ages to get through my, I had bonus slides in case anyone was going to ask me tough questions, but I've got, Yeah, okay. Uh, so now we want to the time relative interest account. So um, let's say uh, for, 
for concreteness, when we're talking about which time interests are, rele uh, are, re are relevant to the, the value of death, it's the interests that the individual presently has at the moment at which, um, at which the decision is made. So, according to, um, and now we're talking about, so there's a thalidomide thil 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 mother, so the mother can cure her slight nausea by taking a thalidomide pill that will perform her child. Okay, so, so what is the time relative interest account going to say about this? According to the time relative interest account, the fetus will at most have a very weak, and so easily overridden, interest in not being exposed to this drug. Because even if it's old enough to possess consciousness, it will only be very weakly related in the relevant ways to the child and the adult who will later suffer the consequences of his mother's choice. So this will strike many as implausible as well. Um, it will strike many as, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the fetus will sort of you know, the, the, the fetus will continue to exist anyway, but at the, at the time at which the pill is taken, that fetus has no interests, or very, very weak interests in continuing to exist. So um, it doesn't matter that it will cause much, you know, a huge amount of suffering later down the line. The fact that, the fact that it has, that it's, it's very weakly connected to those future people means that, uh, means that it's very connected to its kind of its later self, means that those are really heavily discounted. So, um, the time relative interest account seems to uh, like get it wrong regarding our, our intuitions in, in this case. Um, and then, okay, so the, the Epicurean view has some, has some of its own, has some of its own um, with implications, so it seems, you know, it, it, it gets the rock, so you know, almost everyone thinks that death is really bad for someone, uh, that it's better for someone to live a longer life rather than a shorter life, assuming the lives are happy. Um, so the fact that it doesn't capture that seems to be a mistake. Um, so, but here, here's, um, uh, so here's, here's uh, my take on it, is that um, uh, it seems uh, highly plausible to me that existence is incomparable with um, non-existence. So it seems like it can't be better or worse for an entity to exist than not exist. So they're just, if we're saying that this existing state is better than this non-existent state, there just isn't, there isn't, an, there isn't, we can't say one is better because there isn't a, there isn't an individual at both ends to do the comparison. So many people think this, this approach is plausible when it comes to the value of creating lives. So look, I mean, how could it be better for someone to exist? Who is it better for? Um, no one, or balderdash, says Jan Narvison. It's just, it just doesn't make any sense. How can we possibly compare existence with non-existence? And so say that uh, it is better to exist. Uh, so it might be better in the sense that there is that there is impersonal value in the world, that it's not that it's better for the person, but we're not interested in things being good for people. It's good that there is happiness in the world rather than it's happiness for an individual. Uh, but I find the, the, the idea that what matters is how lives go for, for individuals uh, or how you know, lives are experienced at a, for a conscious entity at a point in time. Um, and so, uh, there's just no value in in, uh, in creating lives um, on the grounds it's not good for anyone and this is kind of the same and then the epic epicureanism is I think in some ways the more anatrical symmetrical account where it applies the same thinking to the value of creating lives as it does to the value of ending lives which is that look you know we can imagine I exist now and I uh, but I, how, how valuable w would it be if I survived well I mean if I there's no sense in comparing my existence to my non-existence both once I'm alive and before I'm alive. So I think it, it kind of extends that symmetrically. So that counts in its favor. So if you're prepared to kind of bite the bullets about uh, person affecting views, then, um, then I think it's like, it's no bigger cost. So yeah, that's some stuff on the badness of life, on the, on the kind of c confusing implications on each, each of the views you take. So, I don't think the, the the characters of the of the individuals are are relevant. So, if we're interested, if we think that what matters is for 
for individuals how their lives go. Yeah. Um, and if we if we think we can compare these things, then we have a choice between bringing about an outcome where there is more well-being than less well-being. It seems that we ought to do that. I mean, so the 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 alternative would be to. Uh, and what's the possible alternative that you might um, uh, that you might give kind of differential well-being weightings depending upon people's kind of other uh, personal characteristics? Um, but I mean, this is kind of a but. So these are these are kind of separate questions from the ones I'm dealing with here. So this is just yeah. kind of, this, this is just sort of you know assuming that there's you know this kind of fairly standard way of doing it. Um, it's not clear if that would particularly change any of the particularly change any of the answers. I mean, the well-being adjusted life year is just the idea that you know, we're interested in plausible interest in length of life and in quality of life. So we're combining, we've got a, if we're prepared to trade these off, we need some way of kind of combining these into a single score. Um, So this is. So there's a, uh, so you're right to point out there are a couple of ways in trying to make the view precise. So uh, when we're talking about, <clears throat> okay, so two, two sets of comments. So the first is, no, okay. So the first is that um, the way we're talking about, which we're talking about the time relative interest, well, like which interests matter? Is it the interest that the person presently has? If we're just interested in the present interest, then this is just like this implication just, just happens. Um, so we might think that we're interested in the actual interests. So uh, the interests, if the person does exist, the interests the person uh, would actually have in the world. Okay. So this is this is then functioning differently. Um, but so the the version I suggested was a time relative interest based on the present interest. If we move to actual interests, um, we get a different set of problems. So. Uh, one sort of one kind of challenge, uh, one challenge here is that if we're interested in the actual interests, well, if the person continues to exist, we count those interests, so that's good. Okay, but if we don't, if the person doesn't exist, there is no actual person. So then it's neither good nor bad. So that or just or it's zero. Um, so. So. So the value of this, the value of what you do depends upon which world you bring about. So it's not the case that on this view it's better to save the life than to not, because you just can't com you can't compare these different worlds because you're just looking at the value in the worlds as uh, uh, as they appear. So um, <coughs> I mean this is maybe a little bit too too kind of fiddly, but when we when we looked when I mentioned three different person affecting views, I said there was presentism, present, we just care about present people, actualism, we care about those who will actually exist, and then necessitarianism, we care about those who will exist anyway. So the, the, the kind of the concern with the actualist one is that um, if you, uh, is that the value, of the, the value of the future depends upon what you choose to do now, 
So you, you, so you're, you don't have any reasons for bringing about a happy world or a miserable world. So if you bring about a miserable world, that will be bad. But from the kind of, but from the perspective of now, uh, there isn't like there's nothing bad about doing it. It's only it's only bad if you do it. If you bring about a happy world, it's only good if you do it. But it's not that it's, but you don't have any reasons to bring about any of those worlds in the first place. So, um, so kind of a different way of making uh, the time relative interest account precise, moving from present interest to actual interest. Then it's just not clear what we're supposed to do in the first place. Are we supposed to save the child? Well, if you save the child, it will be good. If you don't save the child, it will be bad. Should I save the child? Well, if you save the child, it will be good. <laughs> but should I save the child? Well, if you <laughs> it just doesn't doesn't tell you what you are. It's not action guiding. So it might be the correct account of, you know, the correct account of the value of the universe, but it doesn't it doesn't tell you what to do. So that's that's the kind of the other way. And if you say, look, we care about all possible interests, then we just seem to be back at we just seem to be back at totalism. So if the person exists, and if it has that interest, uh, and that interest is met, then that will be good. But then this is kind of given up on the spirit of the view, because if you're looking at just present interests, then it's, it can be good to create uh, new lives. And the kind of, and you know, the, the, what this is supposed to be trying to capture is there's, you know, there's nothing bad in, there's nothing good in creating new lives, but once someone exists, it depends upon how, you know, we want to be saving, it's better to be saving 20 year olds than two year olds because the two year olds have much weaker connections to their future self. And if we're just counting all possible interests, then, then we've kind of abandoned the spirit of the view. So, yeah, both ways of making the view precise have um, some tricky, tricky uh, implications. Yeah, A anyone else? Um, do you think that the necessitarian view compared to the presentist view that they have very different implications? I found this argument quite plausible that it's very easy to um, change which child is being conceived just because it takes just like very, very slight um, difference in time of conception and then another sperm will hit another like hit the same egg and then another child will be conceived and uh, from this perspective um, the set of necessary people seems to be very very close or very, uh, similar to the set of um, uh, present people because there will almost be no future childs that are necessary right um, what do you think of this uh, so that's what we're going to be discussing in week four. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, what I, yeah, so I basically, I will discuss this at great length in, in, in week four, but yeah, I think that is the implication. So presentism and necessitarianism, they've got different stories for why we care about people, but I think in practice they often end up, they end up being, I mean, there, are, there aren't very many people who exist in the future and are necessary. So imagine, you know, we, we received some broadcast from some aliens that they were going to be landing on the moon in a thousand years' time. Okay, so we've received the broadcast. We don't know. Um, so we're recipients of this information, but it's not like we're able to change which aliens exist. So those aliens, so you know, we're considering, oh, we can put a bomb on the moon and blow them up when they arrive, just booby trap it in advance because we think they're going to be nasty aliens. Okay, well, those are future necessary people. You know, those particular individuals will exist whatever we do. Um, but I mean, outside those kind of cases, yeah, in practice, necessary people turns out to be the same as our present people. Okay, thank you very much. See you next week where we will be, what are we talking about next week? Uh, so next week we'll be looking at the, we'll be thinking about the best ways to improve the happiness of current people, so make people happier during their lives. Um, and I will be uh, disagreeing with the kind of approach advocated by current effective altruists that poverty is the most effective way to, uh, to do this. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.